Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Yeah. Welcome to MySec Southfield. My name is Brett Hansen. I am the Southfield coordinator. Uh, there are multiple different meetings taking place, and I just noticed I don't have my notes from what we we're just discussing. We have uh, MySec Grand Rent Once. If you are having issues, you'll probably see this post a little bit later. Uh, there's also <laughs> MySec Jackson that meets the second Tuesday of the month, MySec Lansing that meets the second Wednesday, and of course MySec Southfield and Grand Rapids that meets the second Thursday of the month. Uh, there's also ISC Squared. For those who are interested, I have some uh, links here if you want to get involved in those groups, and North Oakland ISSA, Motor City ISSA, and Lansing ISSA. Uh, and we're currently meeting at the Town Square Food and Spirits. Please pass your thanks to the staff that have provided the room and great service, and also thanks to Tech Systems that have provided the snacks you have over here. Please help yourself. We don't want any leftovers. Uh, we ask everyone to be part of my sec to contribute, and then you get back whatever you put in. That's how volunteerism works. If you have a topic for a talk, let me know what you would like to see. That way we can try to find someone with that expertise to get them up here to talk. And then if you are interested in giving a talk, by all means, ping me. Uh, we're looking for people for January, March, and April moving on. Uh, uh, February should be taken care of with the OWASP talk, uh, which is Brad is uh, leading up. So look forward to those announcements. Uh, also, Miles, uh, my sex social. Uh, quick show of hands. We've currently debated this before, uh, earlier. It would be the Thursday after Christmas. Who is interested in doing a social that Thursday? So if we planned one, you guys think you would just be there? The huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's enough hands. I'm going to go ahead and tell Janae that we're gonna, we want to schedule that. Uh, it's going to be in Royal Oak, probably one of the two locations uh, to be determined, and we'll get that posted and shared with everybody. Um, also, Converge Detroit is only 159 days away. It's coming up quickly. Uh, May 16th and 17th, early bird tickets are $100, and they're on sale until, I think, February 28th. Uh, job postings and seeking jobs. Anybody here have any job postings they would like to share? Yes? Ally Financial has VRSO, Business Risk Security Officers, Security Architects, uh, I think a CSERT Manager, CSER lead. Uh, or CSERT Lead. Uh, Maybe a sock person. Uh, we got all kinds yes. of stuff. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. Yeah. And who do you guys work through a recruiting, or you guys do hire direct? We have internal um, recruiters, but they're they're staffing companies too. But so visit your website is the best yeah. place to find out about that. Um, careers. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Anybody else? Fantastic. Uh, anybody looking for jobs? Go visit the website. <laughs> <laughs> you just got a job. <laughs> all right. Uh, other announcements. Special events? CTF Saturday. CTF this Saturday. This Saturday? Can you go ahead and shout that a little bit louder? Where at? What time? Uber Ether and Wixom, I believe. That's what I've heard. Okay, so there is a CTF sure. this Saturday at <laughs> Uber Ether. Uh, check the Slack CTF channel, I assume. All your information is going to be there if you're interested. Move, move into the Discord, please. What's Wait, Discord? So there's, there's an actual, uh, join the CDF channel on Slack. There's instructions of joining a special communication there that's gonna happen just for this local CTF. There's also another one that I signed up my sec for called um, CTF Time, I think it's called. It's uh, hosted by Gaspersky. So we're in there as an actual group, it's unlimited. So it's work from home. Uh, we're not actually gonna physically meet up with this CTF, but we're gonna start doing ACTF a month in that chat. No. And I'm gonna it's gonna be a hybrid between meeting up or doing it at home. So it all really depends on what you guys wanna do. If there's something that you guys think will be interesting, ping me or ping anyone in that group, and we can sign us up and to do it. Okay, fantastic. Any other announcements? All right, without further ado, we have Anthony Tibby Tibbets for risks and vulnerabilities in enterprise visual. All right, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me out. Um, as as the slide says, this is a talk on risks and vulnerabilities within audiovisual solutions. Um, what do you mean? I have to update. So I'm sure we've all experienced the uh, the dreaded conference call bingo, right? Where you are trying to dial in and somebody's ordering McDonald's, somebody's dropping their kid off. There's just a whole lot of nope up there. Um, but I am a audiovisual support technician. I've been in IT for about four years. Um, I'm currently going to Eastern Michigan for uh, information assurance and cyber defense. I like breaking things and I like sloths and cats. 
Um, <clears throat> so why the talk, right? Um, long story short, I went, I went to GERCon, was really inspired, um, and I decided I want to give a talk on something, right? Um, I realized a AV devices, like audiovisual devices, are kind of like the little things in the wall that nobody really thinks about until they break, and then everybody thinks about them, and then I'm getting called, right? Um, so like they're designed and installed, and, and organizations often vet, you know, and maybe think about it like when they, when they buy these equipment, or this equipment, but they're often riddled with vulnerabilities, and uh, nobody really pays attention to it. You know, I, I think even myself, I was like, well, you know, what could, what, what could go wrong, right? That's just, it's just a phone, or that's just a video conference system. That's like what it does, and we, as the information security community, know, oh, no, 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 that's not how that works at all. Um, <clears throat> So we're going to go through kind of looking at like AV, IoT vulnerabilities, um, looking through different device sort of categories, uh, going to go through audio conferencing, but how to you know, patch up those and all, all these vulnerabilities that we see. Um, so I don't think I need to tell anybody, that, um, like who cares? Um, but you can, sell, you can see that it's grown exponentially since kind of the birth of it, um, and that continues even in 2018. Um, according to Kaspersky, uh, devices grew threefold in 2018, and brute force attacks are still a really, really good portion of the attacks, right? Um, so it's a, it's a really big problem, and uh, the way that relates is that a lot of AV devices nowadays, they're jumping in on the whole, like, ooh, let's put, like, a network port on all of our devices. Like, why would you need to? Because profit margins, right? Um, and that causes problems. Um, also, default passwords, right? We all know the default passwords are a really big problem, really big thing. I know the Python. I'm sorry. There's more. There's more. I know. Can somebody please calm him? Um, no. <laughs> default passwords, right? It's like we we all hear about it. Um, it's a really really big problem in AV devices as well. Um, the top five usernames and passwords, right, can get you know a ton of access. You know, the Mirai botnet was built off of like 80 something passwords, but you know just like very common, like easy passwords, right? And you can just take down everything as the botnet showed, right? Oh. Bunch of default passwords. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Lights just start strobing. It's, um, it's just an AV device. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these, are, I used Shodan for my research, and that's what we're going to dig into. Um, this was just like a little graphic on ports are really open too, so it's not even just passwords. Um, there's so many ports that are just like open by default, or like users are like, hey, I'm really cool, let's open a bunch of ports and then make our devices super vulnerable. Um, it's a big problem, right? <clears throat> and these are, this is some of my data that I found. Um, these are individual IP addresses. Yeah. <laughs> that was my face when I found that this one had 38 <laughs> ports open? <laughs> Why? <laughs> what? Um, even seven, it's just like, that's a lot. Um, Keep in mind, this talk is coming from a AV guy perspective. Um, I am not yet a security professional, so there it is a very like low-level talk. None of this is like dropping zero days, taking down craziness. Um, all this stuff can be pretty much done by like anybody, and that's kind of the big problem of it too. Right. So, what are audiovisual solutions? Right. Um, generally, anything that's in a conference room. Right. So you got monitors, you got projectors like this guy, you got microphones, you got switchers. Um, there's phones, right? I'm, everybody's obviously used a phone, I'm sure, at some point. Um, video conference systems, hardware devices, switchers, right? All this stuff. Uh, these are some of the main brands that you see out there. Uh, Crestron was definitely the biggest brand and uh, manufacturer that I found. They had like 20, 20 something thousand uh, devices that I found that were online. Um, but these other, these other brands are really popular too. Xtron's really big, it's kind of just like a jack of all trades. Would you say that Creston's prevalence in vulnerability is a byproduct of them being the largest provider of AV solutions, or are they just that bad? I don't know, personally. Um, they are definitely really, really popular, but so is like Xtron, for example. It really depends, I think, on the company. So like AMX um, is also a pretty popular one, not as big as Crestron, but they make a lot of controllers and, and, and equipment. Um, but they had a security kind of upgrade recently, right? Where they were like, we're gonna take security seriously. And all the tech guys were like, thank God. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the same stance with Crestron. Um, I can tell you from what I found, it's not great. <laughs> Um, but it, it, I think it's a little bit of both, you know. Um, and, and I didn't really even look into all these. I wanted to look into Biomp systems. They do uh, digital signal processing, um, Sharp makes monitors, right? But there's just so much stuff here. I think I originally started all this and I was like, I'll just look at all of it. It's fine. Like, there's 
probably like five of them or something, and I was very, very wrong. Um, I had to very quickly narrow down my scope. Um, so I used Shodan uh, to, to get a lot of my information and do a lot of my research. Um, you know, I, I've never used like Nmap or, or any of this, you know, crazy lead hacks or stuff, right? Um, so I was like, Shodan, you know, it's pretty cool, right? You can find devices that are connected. Um, if you don't know what Shodan is, it's an internet of things search engine, right? So if it talks to the internet in some way, shape, or form, you can probably find it here, right? Um, so I, I found a lot of really cool devices here. And the other thing that's cool to mention, um, I know there's a lot of students in the room. If you do have a .edu email address, so if you have access to that, you get a free, or you can get a free Shodan account, which gives you uh, 100 export credits, and like each credit gives you 10,000 data points. It's really, really cool stuff. It, it unlocks a lot more than just like going and seeing the web page as not a logged in user. Um, definitely check it out. Um, so <clears throat> one thing that, that's interesting to mention or uh, important to mention is when I was looking through Shodan, I quickly learned about HTTP status codes, right? Um, some of this probably is pretty basic knowledge, but for me, uh, I'd never really read into that. Um, and it was really nice to sort through HTTP status codes, because um, I could find the sort of what was open and then what didn't have an HTTP page, right? So, you know, just kind of filtering out what I could actually touch and play with and, you know, maybe wouldn't block me off and what's just like, you know, uh, some random control port that I can't really... Uh, it's a pretty general term. Uh, a lot of the data was really hard to parse through. Um, and the, the original sample that I actually had was way bigger. I think it was like 70,000. But I cut out a good chunk of that because it was mostly displays and Roku TVs. And I don't know if... I necessarily wanted Roku TVs to be in with like projectors and you know this sort of enterprise conference level equipment. I mean, if you're at Google, well, I guess maybe not Google, but if you're at a cool organization, and they have Roku TVs good for you, but probably not what I'm looking for. So I was able to track that over time. Um, as I was doing my research, I didn't see any crazy increases or decreases, um, but maybe going up a little bit. Uh, the top one is is the total that I was telling you guys about. It'd be interesting to see after Christmas how many yeah. that spike. Right, right. <laughs> I made some sort of what the difference is. Amazes me that many people. Like you, we hear a lot of times about the low hanging fruit. This is like the really low hanging fruit that I was able to apparently touch and, and, and manipulate. Right. So, audio conferencing. Right. Um, Take some water. <clears throat> I was like, okay, you know, I'm sure there's phones out there, right? I wonder how many phones I can find. Apparently, Italy just is like the place for VoIP. I don't know why, but per the Shodan uh, query, there like most of those were from Italy. I don't know why. I, it, it, all the Italians are just like really, really big on it. I don't get it. Um, didn't really find a ton of stuff, but I was, you know, looking into it. Um, <clears throat> VoIP attacks, right? Uh, traditional ones are, you know, okay, people are listening in on my call, right? Um, of course, DDoS, right? If you know somebody could block out your entire phone system, it'd probably be bad news for your organization. Um, masquerading, you can impersonate user, right? Use some social engineering. These are all classic things that I'm sure we're relatively familiar with. Uh, toll fraud, I don't know if that's super popular anymore. I think that was much more of like a old school phone thing, right? Because yeah. tolls aren't really a thing anymore. I don't know, I'm not a phone freaker or any of that, but um, I think the most common one that we see nowadays I've been just badgered by it all the time. It's like phone spoofing, where it's like your grandma calls you and it's some person from Microsoft who's like, there's a huge virus on your computer and you need to give us money. And I'm like, who are you? Um, there's actually a modern version of toll fraud that's not growing popular, but really? it's still always been there. Uh -huh. Where instead of just calling up and you know, making fraudulent phone calls, you're actually forcing your system to call back into a toll number. Oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. So I just include, right, right, right. Okay, yeah. So even sort of old school methods, you know, are getting new school life, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so how many, how many of us get, have seen phones like these guys, right? Conference phone and a, uh, a desk phone, right? Uh, well, these guys were susceptible to a vulnerability that came out in about August, uh, or I think it, it wasn't patched in August, uh, but it's the 7800, 8800, and 8821 series phones, which is like all of that. Um, so a pretty widespread, you know, swath of phones that, that are affected by this. Um, definitely bad news, right? I know, as far as I understand, DDoS is a pretty difficult thing to mitigate. I know there's like Cloudflare and all this stuff, but for audiovisual devices, maybe that's not the case, right? Um, so definitely something that's there. 
Um, so I started going into, you know, further deeper in, I looked into video conferencing. Um, I work around with video conferencing equipment like these guys uh, a lot at work, and I said, oh, okay, well these are pretty, probably pretty locked down. They're really expensive devices. Um, surely anybody who bought any of this stuff isn't going to have any of it online, and I was wrong. Um, <clears throat> this is my shiny graph with, with pie chart. <laughs> um, this is kind of like the, my findings that I found. Uh, the SX20 is the most popular model that I found. Um, nearly 2.3 thousand models, um, little over 3,300 devices online. Uh, a lot of a lot of video conference devices that are online. It is important to mention um, that just because they're online doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Um, you gotta you gotta mind that these devices are supposed to talk to other devices. So the fact that you can see them isn't necessarily the biggest sort of red flag. Um, but I also don't know how many of these have like default passwords or just like not secure, you know what I mean? Like all the, the typical risks, right? Uh, but there was a vulnerability within video systems too. Um, so not quite the silver bullet that we thought they were, just like being there and hoping that they always work. Um, and they're in all of these different, all of these different devices here. Um, the most recent one is the WebEx kit, which is basically just a little like soundbar video conference system. You just pop it on your monitor, and then boom, you have video conference, right? Um, so everything kind of from older devices to even newer ones. Again, just a Linux DDoS, not not quite as un, you know invulnerable as we maybe expected or treated them as. And I found a uh, control panel that was open too. Um, logged in as admin, mind you. So that was great. Uh, just completely unauthenticated. You could come in and this is the screen that you would see if you were me. So if I'm managing these systems and I'm setting up uh, you know, web bridges and like all sorts of video conference stuff, this is how they do it. And it's just online, it's just there. <coughs> what? You can go in and change the back paper, or the wallpaper, right? Which is kind of just like, oh, whatever, okay. Um, but there's more stuff, I mean, they, they, there's a security tab and it's like, hey, you should have a password. Like, why don't you have a password? Yeah, upload custom wallpaper. Right, you can upload custom wallpaper, like you can have all sorts of, I think everybody's like, all right, yeah, there we go. Um, even better than that, you can't actually see the camera, but you can control it. Right? How would you feel if you're in there and you're having like a sweet board meeting and you're like, yeah, we got these all proposals and the camera just goes, it like looks at everybody. <laughs> like, what? Um, and then I mean, this is the call directory, right? So these are other video systems that they presumably talked to. That was an IP address I blocked out. I got that one. Um, you can go through and, and change everything on this. That's, that's why it's here, but it's hopefully got some sort of password on like this, this one. This was my favorite part of the video system. You can, you can send out strings from inside their, their web client, and it even tells you how to do it. Um, so you could just Google it, of course, but it also is like, hey, you wanna call somebody? Like, here you go, this is how you do it. Um, it's got API, like all, what? Not, not a ridiculous thing to have sort of on your web page, but a ridiculous thing that that's not logged in, or that's not um, authenticated, and just like is open. Just like, come on in, it's just like Google, man. Just touch all the things. Let's <laughs> redact that out of my talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this was another video conference. Uh, this was from a university. Um, it's a bit of an older one, so Tanberg was acquired by Cisco. Um, but a lot of the equipment's pretty much like the same thing. Um, and you can go through, this is the same thing, you can go through and you can, you can completely just you know, call anybody you want. You can see streaming, there's text chat, um, all the same settings that you probably could have the older one. I mean, this is an older model, um, but you can do all that. Again, you can change the background. You can uh, say that you need encryption, right? There's all these files you can upload. Um, Wait, that encryption required, does that allow you to encrypt? I believe what it just, give you access to? huh? What would that give you access to? I'm not entirely sure. Um, when I was kind of spelunking around here, I didn't want to touch too much stuff because I didn't want to break anything. Um, so I really tried not, it was kind of like a look and don't touch methodology, but I, I, from what I understand, you can just kind of label that you need encryption on it, or um, it's, sort of, it's sort of just like a warning, just similar to like a, a welcome screen. Um, but I, I could be wrong. I haven't actually looked into it entirely. Um, so it's like a banner. Yeah, it, most of these are just like banners. Um, 
I, I believe it's just like if, if there is encryption that's enabled and it's not enabled or something, it, it's or you can you can change that banner face that, that shit shows up. So when we start finding these areas where it says choose file, mm -hmm. have you clicked on any of those buttons? I didn't click on any of the buttons. Okay, no. no. I was just curious if it's we were discussing when you choose files, it choosing the file from your machine. Or right, right. That's the good. Yeah, it's like oh, maybe you could even go in there and then you could you know diversity or trajectory diversity. What's that? If it's choosing from their local network resource, because that system is going to have to have certain network right. to do its job. Right. You might be able to pivot through that. Right, right. And that can get nastier. That's what I'm saying. Like I didn't go too far because I'm honestly just relatively low knowledge on all this, but. You can clearly see the applications of where you could pivot forward on m any of these devices, right? You know, potentially go through the network there. Um, I mean, at the very least, you put up some stupid, you know, meme photo on their thing saying, "Hey, change your password," right? Um, this one, I definitely didn't touch anything with because I've never used Polycom and I'm just really afraid to break something. <laughs> but uh, it's another one that's just open as well. Here's a list of different video conference, potentially rooms or sites, um, and there's IP addresses with those two. So a, a lot of times in these interfaces, you can even find other connections to it. So it's like, okay, well maybe I didn't find it, you know, I got in here, unlocked, right? Didn't really find anything. Well, ooh, here's the control, master control IP address, or here's like another one that it talked to. And so you can even pivot from there, right? So I was really interested, I think one of the things I was really interested in looking at was digital signage, right? I feel like everybody's like, oh yeah, like what if we could hack them all, or, you know, or like put, you know, pictures of dick butt everywhere, right? Like, that'd be great. Um, maybe that's just what I do, I guess, but. <laughs> I found a lot of TVs, as I mentioned. Uh, the biggest, the biggest one being the Roku TV and the Samsung's TV in there is in there as well. Um, but I didn't include this really because, uh, I couldn't quite sort through it. Um, I had enough of a time just parsing through like the 28,000 something data points that I had of the actual AV devices. And even those weren't like entirely all AV devices. Um, but there's still a lot of them out there. Um, so absolutely, I would encourage you guys to go and play on Shodan. You know, you can just do product TV as I did up there. And then again, HTTP 200 OK. And there you go. You can search for all web pages that are open or at least drop you out a landing screen to log in somewhere. Um, I did find some digital signage devices, though. Um, the Crestron likes to do this thing where they put like web GUIs for everything. So, kind of to answer your question, yes and no. So, uh, some of the newer versions, they 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 have default passwords that um, that that are actually on them, whereas the older ones they just like left open, um, and they would just automatically enable like port 80 and not tell you, <laughs> um, and a bunch of other ports. But they 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 put a lot of. Uh, web GUIs uh, up so that you can go and interface with and you can control things like as a technician but you can also go in and you know mess with things as a bad guy too. Um, <clears throat> so this device uh, basically just puts out content to somewhere, right? D nothing too crazy, uh, but maybe you could go somewhere. I mean, the hack target was hacked through the air conditioning, right? So the, the possibilities are limitless. Uh, I did think it was interesting that you could go in and turn on streaming and then you could go to that stream address and I guess you could see what it was, maybe do other nasty stuff, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I, I really didn't find a ton of physical hardware devices. Um, as I was doing some researching on kind of the top devices and the most popular ones, the systems use are displays nowadays. Most TVs and professional displays, um, I mean, shoot, even my home TV just has digital signage software in it. Um, TVs are, you know, it's just... So control systems. Uh, these do what you would... What they, what they sound like, they control things. They just be limited to one sort of function for your touch panel, especially when you spend a crap ton of money on it because, fun fact, audiovisual devices for enterprises are really expensive too. Um, so not only are they just really kind of insecure and don't have great security practices applied to them, they're just gonna cost you a ton of money too. Um, but you're gonna have them be like conference room controllers, smart home controllers. Um, they have a new function down there where you can actually be, uh, you can have it as like outside of a conference room and then sync it up to your, uh, your email server. And so that way you can see if the room's booked or open. Um, you can even schedule from the room. Right. Oh, and the biggest thing is uh, they have a uh, camera and a microphone on them too. <laughs> what could go wrong? On the touch panel. On the touch panel, yeah. Right, right. That's so I was like, really? Okay. Mind you, a couple of these other brands were like, we're not going to do that because that just sounds like a bad idea. 
and this is why. Um, so a lot of text, but basically this was a vulnerability discovered by uh, Ricky Lachey and I don't know how to say his last name, uh, Jackson. Um, <clears throat> basically up to this firmware version, through their like telnet-like connection protocol or connection, um, where you go and program, uh, they have a program called Crestron Toolbox that interfaces with the device. Um, it basically just like operates over telnet. There was no password on it or anything. <laughs> so you could go in and do everything. Um, so he, clearly a you know, pretty, pretty vulnerable thing, hence the, the door. Um, and these are some of the biggest organizations that I found. It, it was labeled X60 because it was the 760, 1060, and 560 CSW models. So if you go out and find those, um, I was able to search in like Shodan and sort through my data to find those. Um, these are the <coughs> organizations that have a ton of them. Um, if you're on this list, if you're watching, please talk to your network people and tell them to fix this. If I shouldn't be able to see this, I don't want to see this. If I come back in a year and I see this, I'm going to find you. Why the hell is MIT on yeah. Research. Right. <laughs> Reasons. Um, <laughs> well, and, and mind, mind you, this isn't just like touch panels that are open and like unauthenticated, um, but these are touch panels that are on Shodan and, and don't have any firewalls, right? Um, and they're ones with microphones. Right, and, then, and all of these touch panels yeah, have microphones and cameras. Yeah. Um, and did I mention that they're in uh, hotels? The conference rooms? I'm sure nothing secret's going on. No, no. Well, and, and that's the, I mean, this is, some of these fancy hotels will have them in like the suites. Oh, sweet. So like you naturally think of like, oh, okay, big, no, nice little conference room, you got a big conference like Gurkhan or whatever, right? Um, you, you got a nice touch panel to do it, right? But they, they have them in these really decked out suites too to like control the lights and stuff or control the music, right? This is bad news. Um, this is kind of a breakdown of the uh, devices that I found. There was 313 total devices of the X60. Um, as you can see, the percentages are not great. <clears throat> For those that I found, I mean, nearly 90% of all of them are vulnerable to this this year, which proves my point that nobody goes in and, and, and upgrades firmware, right? Um, people install these things and then they forget about it until somebody calls me because they're like, hey, it's not working anymore. And then I don't come in and fix it because I don't have enough time because I have 500 other rooms to deal with, right? From, uh, from a baseline perspective, mm -hmm. uh, has your experience been where if you're introducing, introducing a new physical uh, hardware or software to the environment, it has to have a baseline scan and baseline configuration done to it prior or? It depends on the company. His, his question was just for people online. When you bring on new devices, um, do you like necessarily vet those devices, or do you put them through, you know, security uh, checks, you know, and pen testing, you know, make sure, okay, you know, we, we don't necessarily trust the, you know, the the manufacturer. We're going to make sure to check and double time, uh, double check our eyes and dot our, however that expression goes. You know what I mean? Um, it depends on the organization. I know that my organization does, um, and. Uh, it really depends, but that, that's something that I apply later is that, yeah, we need to be you know, going in here and one, updating firmware, right? It's a pain in the butt to go to every single room, but there's ways around that. Um, <clears throat> but you should be vetting these, these devices before you go in there. You should be going in and trying to break them before you put it in, um, but people aren't doing that. So if I break a couple touch panels, can I say you told me so? Uh, no, 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 you can't. <laughs> um, so update your devices, right? This is the TSW um, X60 firmware count that I found. You can see a majority is the, you know, 1.0, right? And the only reason it's not the first one is probably because, like, it's probably that one school that just bought all of them, honestly, and it wasn't, like, the first model. Um, but only, like, 10% of them are, are good. Only 10% of them are safe. Maybe that's changed since I pulled this graph. Maybe that's changed since I pulled the data. I highly doubt it. Update your devices. So let's see what we can find, right? Um, we looked at the data. Okay, let's go in and let's you know let's touch some stuff. Um, as I mentioned, this is the the cross -trying control port is forty one seven ninety four. Um, that's what it talks back on. Um, and a lot of these uh, ports are just open whenever whenever they're installed. Uh, some of the newer devices, as I said, like with the firmware, they've closed that off and they're like, oh wait, maybe that's bad, we should, we should not do that, which is good. It took them a while, but it was good. Um, <clears throat> so this is one of the touch panels that I found. Um, 
And you can go in and just like the other control panels, you can you know, change a lot of things. It's not the, the full you know, access. It doesn't just like allow you to go in and you know, turn on like the camera and like watch it or something, right? They were, they were completely ridiculous about it, but you can go in and do a lot of stuff that you'd imagine you could do. You can see the, uh, you know, the, the main firmware version. Um, interesting point about the serial number too. You know, it's pretty normal that you'd see this stuff as an audiovisual technician, but it's interesting from a security perspective because a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of manufacturers will use that as an authentication method. So they say, who are you? You know, you're calling about this device. Maybe, you're, maybe I'm a bad guy trying to get more information about this device. And I call Crestron and they say, hey, I'm having an issue with this touch panel. I say, oh, okay, hold on. Um, you know, you're who, who and who? Okay, well, can you give me the serial number from that just to verify? I'm like, I sure can. Right? You know, it, 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 it's little things that I don't necessarily have an answer to, but you know, you can definitely use the wrong way. One of the interesting things, I didn't go to test it. Um, I would love to do that with some of the in stock stuff that we have at my, my company, um, but I haven't gotten a chance to do that yet. They give you a chance to upload firmware version. Is it only going forward or can I go back? Because if I can go back, it doesn't matter if you have an updated firmware. Um, you know, that, 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 that you know, has 2.0 or 3.0, I can log into your thing which you didn't put a password on or maybe you put a bad password on or you know, whatever. And now I can just downgrade you back to version zero, bro. Right, like, I assume they probably, you can't do that, but I don't know. <laughs> or you um, break it completely. Right, yeah. right. It's also like install a vulnerability. Right, <laughs> well, and, 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 I mean, so like, even other than that, you can go in, even other than that, you can go in and update the project file. So. I don't know what that specifically looks like. Um, at the very least, you could break it just by trying to like send it something it doesn't like. Well, this is we'll fine. We'll watch it. Yeah. Is the firmware open source? Because that would be even better. Just recompile <laughs> one that's showing like, hey, I'm on a good version. It's I think. Cool. You, I don't know if it's necessarily open source, but you can. You can go and like download it, and you don't usually need a password. So you could do some firmware analysis and then do bad things too. Most audiovisual devices, like they want you to for update your firmware, so they're like, here, come take your firmware. You know, the, the, like a lot of audiovisual uh, manufacturers will have special, um, like technician logins, you know, and, and stuff that's behind that. Like, okay, you can't get to these files, but firmware and a lot of like, um, you know, technical specifications, you can just either Google search or they're on there, and they're like, here, please take it. You know, does that answer your question? How am I doing on time? Um, <clears throat> This is a newer TSW760 touch panel. Um, so you can see it's got a nice shiny new upgrade. Um, and it was so close, the firmware version. It was so close, but it wasn't quite there. Um, fix it, please. <laughs> this was great. Um, this, I, I thought I'd seen everything that there was, right? And I wasn't even fully into like exploring all the things. Um, I was going in playing around and I connected to this one touch panel and it downloaded this on my computer and I was like, well, that's weird. And I was like, I wonder what that is. It's, it, my computer stopped it and it was like, hey, don't do that. Um, so I looked up photo.skr and photo.skr is a Monero miner that was on your touch panel. <laughs> ma ma cryptocurrency miners operating, stealing power off of your touch panel. What? This is, this is great. This is great. <laughs> well, they're probably not using it, so what's the problem? Well, that's the thing. I mean, like, these things don't, they're not using it. You're, you're not wrong. Um, most of the time, they're not. Um, you know, I, I don't think the Monero miner was like, that touch panel, that's the one. But it just shows, you know, like, Mirai botnets don't necessarily just affect, like, routers and, you know, computers. Like, touch panels are vulnerable and audiovisual systems are vulnerable. Most of them aren't really impressive as far as like computing power, but some of them are pretty beefy. You know what I mean? Some of these like upper, you know, video processors or audio processors, they got a lot going on there. And for a, you know, a cryptocurrency miner, you could probably get some good stuff out of it. Yeah, I was going to say for like crypto mining, it's largely done through a lot of browsers. Like instead of 25% of like over inside of the game, it doesn't even need to be powerful. Right. 
right? Right. Because they just mass do it. Well, and then keep keep in mind that if this one was um, this firmware version, you can probably bet that most, like 99% of these other ones, are not the same or are the same firmware version and probably have the same security measures, if at all. And so you didn't just get this like kind of slow touch panel. You just got the whole 125 else throughout your entire school or organization or wherever it's it's touching, right? More than just that, you can go in, um, I just Google searched the telnet commands, um, the whole bunch of stuff, and, and this, is, this is all the stuff that you could do without a password. Um, you could set administrator groups, you could create new users, uh, I mean, I don't even think this is the full list. The telnet, so at least some of them are safe, right? Well, it's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's bad news, man, it's just bad news. Um, you can go in and take a screenshot, I think that's just a, like a screenshot, screenshot, and not like a like take a picture. But I would not be surprised if there was some way that you could go in and like, whoop, take a picture and then ping it back to me. Um, yes, and actually, that's I'm glad you mentioned that because this is the video that shows that. So um, this is a DefCon video. Um, from a talk, let me pause this really quick. Let me see if I can. Um, <clears throat> so Ricky Lachey and uh, the, I forget what his other name is, but they discovered all these vulnerabilities both in the uh, TSW touch panels as well as the MC3 uh, controller. And he uh, he creates a script, and he this is a talk like I said that he did at DEF CON. He's got his own touch panel there and a master controller and all this stuff. Um, he he creates a script and pings it and does just that with this vulnerability. Hold on with this vulnerability. I don't know if it's picking up the audio on the other side there. I hope it's not. Because the audio is all sorts of whack in the video. You can, you can find the actual video online. So you enable spy mode, creates RTSP, and ooh, pops up VLC, there's the camera feed. And you can see that his, that's his hand moving, right? Did I mention these are in hotels, or <laughs> conference rooms, or organization, or, um, or, or what is it, uh, schools, right? As soon as I found this, I was like, man, I'm not paying for school anymore. I'm just uh, going to this. That's great. I'll do all my learning online. That's what they always say, right? <laughs> Through the touch panel. That'd be great. How'd you get your master's? Well, it's a long story. I just learned about stealth bomber. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, and that's the other thing to mention. As I mentioned, audiovisual equipment is really expensive. Me and my friends always joke around, we're gonna go into creating an audiovisual manufacturing company because we just rich. You know, you can sell HDMI cables for like 50 bucks or like 80 bucks or something. Um, so these, these, this equipment is in probably high level rooms because you know the high level people get all the cool stuff, right? So vulnerabilities like this where you could literally spy on people, not good. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's, yeah, I'm, I'm quitting school and becoming a day trader. That's it, yeah. I have just like a hive or like a horde of touch panel Monero miners. <laughs> um, so this is the other vulnerability. It's, it's, it's through the same CVE. The same guy discovered it. Um, it's the same thing. Um, you can decipher super user passwords, but other than that, it's the exact same thing. Um, these controllers are little tiny little boxes that just control things like lights, projectors. Um, they're used all over the place. This was one of the, I think, the second most popular device that I found. Um, and again, people don't update their firmware version, right? Um, so most of these, you know, are vulnerable. It's not nearly as bad as the touch panels, but it's still pretty bad. Um, and this is another video from his demo. Um, this is great because uh, he. You can actually go in, like I said, without a password, and you can go and play with all the stuff, but you're locked in the sandbox. And he was like, well, I want to get out of the sandbox. So we did. There's no audio, like I said, because the audio is a little messed up on the video, but um, runs his own script that he wrote, right? Um, he wants to open up a bash shell so he can get in and get full control, right? Presto! Now he has a bat shell on this conference room controller. So he is fully root now, has root privileges, root access, not limited to Crestron's controls and functions. He could run a Minecraft server off of it if he wanted to. 
right? All sorts of bad stuff. Um, this is my data breakdown that I found. Um, the C, C3, I think it's the CP3 the way, parsed that way for some reason. Uh, the MC3 are the most popular ones by far. Um, but there's still a ton of other devices here too. Uh, PYNG Hub, I'm gonna go into that at the end if we have time, that's a smart home. Um, but ton of different devices, you can see it's kind of gone up over time. Um, the wide, widespread of ports that are open are gonna be the crest on control port, which is good. Um, they don't have a ton of, you know, just extraneous ports that are open and not necessarily needing to, but some of them, as we saw with the original, the, the one that had 43, it's eh, still kind of there. Uh, um, this one looks very interesting. What's that? <laughs> I mean, my number one target on that list. Which one? Vegas. Right, right. Um, and and the, the interesting thing, so it's not just, or you know, it's not just schools. It's not just you know private organizations. Like it's all across the board. Everybody's got some cool boardroom that they want to you know use to debut content and you know to have meetings in. And they got to have some way to do that, right? Like you know, projectors like this are great, but if you got the C-suite, they're not. You know, they they got fancy stuff. So AMX systems. Um, didn't find nearly as many with this one. Um, I don't know if that's because, like I said, AMX has a new security posture that they really tried to vet themselves and say, okay, let's harden ourselves, you know, let's, let's really double down, and I definitely applaud them for that. Uh, but then they found a couple. Um, AMX, you know, just, just to emphasize my point that I said before, that's in the White House. That's, that's an AMX touch panel in the middle there where that uh, red dot is. That one doesn't have a, a camera on it, which is great. Um, and I'm sure they have some, you know, security vetting that they did. They didn't just like plop that bad boy in there and like open it up. But, <laughs> but you never know, <laughs> as everybody snickers in the back. <laughs> um, but even, even, you know, these, these touch panels, even these devices have, you know, vulnerabilities to them. This was a backdoor account access, but the username's Batman and Black Widow. That's definitely what I would do if I was going to put a backdoor in. It, it'd be Batman for sure. Um, but you could go in, you know, and do remote login for dark <coughs> mode and all this stuff. You know, probably some engineer who was designing the product used it, but it was never taken out, and you know, it was just hidden. As often we hear, you know, there's backdoors that are just left in there. Um, Audiovisual devices are no, no, you know, no, uh, no different. Um, <clears throat> this is a, another, uh, you know, uh, this is another vulnerability that I found. Um, I think it had something to do with the password. I can't remember this one specifically, but uh, or no, sorry, this was at the back door as well. Um, you could go in and do all sorts of you know tinkering with this device series. You can go up and look up, look them up um, if you want, but they're pretty popular devices. Um, this is another uh, another list of uh, affected products from this back door. Um, you could go through and you know with elevated privileges. You could change device settings, upload files, right. A lot of the same stuff that we're used to, right? Um, break all the things, right? Um, it doesn't matter what manufacturer and what brand you're in, even if you try to harden yourself, there's still stuff that's here. Um, so the big, you know, the big lesson is patch, 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 right? And as you can see, it's kind of, I know it's really hard to read there, but there's like, oh gosh, 15 different devices of some sorts. You know, a lot of them are controllers, you know, switchers. Um, they don't just make controllers. It's, it's all over the place. Uh, this was a hard-coded password, um, so you could go in, um, I'm not sure what I was trying to do with the web interface, so I, I think there was a web interface that I found, but it was a little, a little wonky. Uh, this appears to be a smart home that I found, um, and so I could go in, I graciously blocked out the, 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 uh, the designer's name, because, for shame. <laughs> um, but you can go in and probably, you know, you could go in and download all these through, like, the FTP, um, right, Just same with the other ones. Uh, this was a, another web GUI that you could go in and control um, <clears throat> for, a, for an AMX master. So similar to the Crestron ones, that, you know, I can look up all this stuff online. I, I had no idea about all this stuff. Um, I've interacted with AB, AMX devices before, um, but I hadn't specifically, you know, touched this one. And I just did a quick Google search, right, for the manual. And then, you know, Control F found what I needed to look for. Here's some of the command strings I need to do. Reset admin password, set FTP port, um, set security profile, right? All this stuff uneth unauthenticated, and then that um, <clears throat> at the last you know vulnerability didn't have any passwords on <coughs> sort of like the telnet or any of that, right? Bad news. Um, more so like the uh, 
like the, the, the one of the, what was it this uh, Cisco device, mm. you can uh, execute commands and strings from the web page that is unauthenticated. Like I just I, at a certain point I just started like picking up the bottle and just being like, <laughs> 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 um, you can go ahead and change all the options, right? This is the same system. Um, you know, I'm logged in. What well, the interesting thing too is that I was logged in under guest. One, I shouldn't be able to get to this. Two, guests definitely shouldn't have to have this access, right? Like, why can guests come in here and change um, your Telnet port and like enable Telnet and all that stuff? Right, right. What can go wrong? What can go wrong? It's fine. <laughs> Create SSL certificate. <laughs> um, well, found, found a bunch of devices online as well. Um, didn't find a ton of specific details on them. Uh, the Netlink series devices is all I really got from it. It would just tell me like the Netlinks. That's Netlinks, and then it would tell me, um, you know, like what firmware version it was. Um, but they're all over the place as well. Um, ports are a little bit more distributed. Uh, 20, port 23 is probably the most popular one. Um, you know, but it's it's still a problem, right? Maybe not as you know rampant as uh, Crestron because uh, you know there's a lot more Crestron, but it's still a problem. It's a big thing. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so miscellaneous hardware devices. So we're talking about switchers, um, little bits and bobs that are not like the main brains, right? Um, this was fun. Extron makes a lot of these little devices that do different things. They you know extract audio, uh, they switch things, they scale things. Um, they're all over the place. This was uh, this was a you know one page I could just go to from Shodan. It pinged up and it said, hey, that's an Extron device. And uh, you go to the you know the web page and it would log you in as admin just by default. Um, I don't know why your switcher needs to be no your switcher doesn't need to be online. That's why. Okay, please take your switcher offline. You can't. I mean, as far as I can see from just a basic glance, you can't really do too much, you know what I mean? You could ruin somebody's day, really piss off the tech guy by changing all of this. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's more and more, you know, more stuff you could do, but you can go through, you can change the audio, change you know, the port, you can reset the device settings and delete all files, that was cool. Like I said, you could really ruin someone's, someone's day. You could upgrade the firmware, change the password. Mind you, again, I didn't log in. It just logged me in as admin. It's just there. Why is that like the default? Um, it sounds like they must have had a password because I was logged in, but I surely didn't do it. It just, it just, it just was, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is a Extron controller. Uh, I actually saw this same controller, I think, at school. <laughs> um, so they're really popular, right? Uh, Extron's really affordable um, compared to some of these other devices. And so they're all over the place, especially in like schools and educational institutions. Um, and they're pretty good for what they do. Again, same thing though. Logged in, web GUI, um, ton of other ports that were open, and I'm just logged in as admin, right? Um, you can go and do whichever, whatever you want. This one was fun. Um, this is a streaming media processor. Um, so this is for, like if you have a, maybe a big conference like this, um, you know, if we had maybe a bit more of a you know, fancy setup, you could actually, you know, use this to stream and do exactly what we're doing here. You know, you could capture my content that I'm that I'm putting out, uh, and you could you could export it out, you know, and stream it out, right? And there's another web page uh, that's logged in as admin. But this one was great because this one I could go and look at. Um, this was for a school, I think. Um, so I had to check it at the right times because otherwise it would just be black lights. But this is somebody's presentation about something. I can do a pop-out view up there. Um, I could start recording. Again, you can change uh, inputs. Um, what's that? These are codes. Right, right, yeah, that's it, yeah. Just, that's, that's why you why went off, that was it. Um, so there's your master's thesis for the Right, right. <laughs> um, and, and mind you, this isn't just, you know, like some device in a rack. I mean, it, it is, but it's got, you know, hard drive space to it, right? So you a pretty, I mean, a pretty fair amount for just a little dedicated standalone device, right? Um, so I wonder what's on there too. So I could go in there as well. Um, and they thought they were really smart because they're like, we're not gonna let you download from here, but we'll tell you how to. Because if you come over here, it says you can upload, but in order to download, you have to do SFTP. 
And then it says, okay, go to this F SFTP site. And you're like, cool, they got a password. Use the same login or admin credentials as was there. I'm logged in already. What? So. Yeah, yeah. So for example, you know, put, put, put this into a real life perspective or well, more situational perspective. Maybe this is at, um, you know, some big announcement, you know, for like, I don't know, Tesla, right? Um, and their stuff is unfortunately online. Well, I could come in and download the pre-recorded uh, announcement about the new Tesla rocket or whatever, or no, the, you know, the new Tesla car, right? You can go in and download all these different talks or recordings that they did. Um, I thought it was funny that you could go in and upload too. You could just like have like a little, uh, like a meme video or something. <laughs> maybe somebody finds it, maybe they don't. Um, <clears throat> so Xtron was definitely the, the least popular devices, uh, but they're still all over the place. The MLC uh, 226 IP controller is really popular. It's pretty cheap. Uh, you see it all over the place. Um, like I said, Xtron's really, really popular in uh, like schools and universities uh, because they're mostly just really, really cheap and that's kind of right within their budget. You can see port 23 is the most popular port. Back to Crestron. Um, Crestron makes a device called Air Media. Air Media is basically Chromecast for corporate, right? It's a lot more expensive and it does the exact same thing. Um, and as Crestron likes to do, they throw a web page on everything. Um, to, their, to their credit, that's kind of how this works. Um, since it is wirelessly, the, the way it works is you'll, you'll show up to a screen and it says go to this IP address and then you download your client for Windows or Mac. Um, <clears throat> and then you can go in and you know, cast or, or stream your content you know, from wherever you need. You don't have to be chained in from a cable, right? Found a ton of them. Um, these are all over. We got Harvard in there. That was cool. Um, I don't know if that necessarily the, all of these are you know, default passwords or not, right? Um, but I wouldn't be surprised um, if a lot of them were. Um, here's kind of a breakdown of the different models. There's the AM100, 200, and 300. Uh, the 100 is the oldest, 300 is the newest. Um, I believe with the 200 and onwards, they have implemented like actually having passwords and just like they kind of they were like, okay, we'll, okay, we'll turn up security a little bit. Um, so that's good. Why are they publicly Right, right. But so even other than that, like okay, well they don't have, you know they, they they don't have a default password, but like why are they there? <laughs> like why could I find them? Um, and more than that, you know, here's some more vulnerabilities, right? Um, these are the AM100s that I found, and a ton of them are vulnerable, right, to these uh, the firmware versions. Again, please update your firmware. Um, it's a pain in the butt. 83% of them are vulnerable. Uh, so you can go in, like I said, through the uh, through the web page and do whatever you want. Um, you know, this one was unauthenticated. You could, I could go in, and here's all the, the things I can do. I can do OS, you know, on-screen display setup, cross-drawn services, um, ton of default ports that were open, 8443, 161, um, ton of stuff, right? Uh, oftentimes, like like in this one, I don't think it has it, but a lot of the time, like as I mentioned before, a lot of these devices will have the master connection IP. What's up? Well, they got a password because they have a log out. They just not able to log out. So right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of there. But it's, again, it's the same thing. Like, like you push it, you log back. I should say, like, I didn't, I didn't specifically do anything to log in. It was just there. Um, um, you could create some mass shenanigans. So the way Air Media works, again, say you can come in and change, upload your own image file to the background if you want. That'd be really fun. Um, but the way Air Media works is that it authenticates with a password. Uh, so yeah, you can go in and change the file. This is the way Air Media will traditionally look, right? It'll say, hey, welcome, you know, this is your, your IP address up at the top here. And so you go into your browser, you connect to it, right? And it'll say download, um, like that pass screen we had. And then it'll mostly, or by default, it has a, a code, right? So not anybody on, the, um, on your network can just go and access that IP and just start streaming whatever they want, right? You have to authenticate with the code. But if, you know, if you're able to get into the web, web page and it's, you know, logs you in by default, you can turn off the code. <laughs> yeah. Which means you can put that up there. <laughs> like, <laughs> Where is that? What's that? Where is that? Oh, the, the 
the Rick Roll? That can't be a Rick Roll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he got me. As a thought leader, I had to answer the question. Um, all right, projectors, right? Winding down to the last little bit. Thank you guys for staying with me. Um, <clears throat> Projectors, all right, you know, that'd be cool. I wonder, wonder if I can, you know, kind of like the Air Media, can I cast my own stuff to your home projector or whatever? That'd be sweet. Didn't find a ton of them, thankfully. I don't know if that's because they're behind firewalls or just there's not a lot of them by default, um, but there are some of, some of them, all right? And, you know, as with all these other devices, you can go in and control whatever you want, right? Uh, these are some Sony projectors. Again, searched by HTTP one, uh, 200 OK, so boom. You can see there's no username or password. Gives you the information there. Uh, yeah. You could turn on the power, which was cool. So even if like the projector was off in their conference room, I guess you, again, you could piss off me. <laughs> I'd be like, turn on all the projectors, waste all the money. <laughs> um, Epson has the same thing. You could come in there. Um, you could you know do admin control. You know change change the source, right? This one was fun because there's Wi-Fi settings. Um, so I don't know if you could extract the password from that, but if you could, um, there's the passphrase for your Wi-Fi. And I mean, there's the SSID, right? So you know, if you're nearby or something. Um, huh? Yeah, that's a web interface. Great, great. See, I didn't know enough about it. I was like, how, how do you extract password? Um, but I'm sure like you find people could. Like, um, it's definitely not something that's that hard to do. You know, if I, as an AV guy, can come in here and find all the stuff that I can break, like, imagine what you guys can do. Um, this is a big problem. So this is another vulnerability. Uh, basically, it would allow you to go in uh, to this Epson projector. It had a function called EasyMP, and uh, you, you could cast whatever you want just by brute forcing it. Um, not, not too cool, but definitely something there, right? Um, am I drilling in the point that AV devices are not <laughs> exempt? from security attacks and are definitely like something to be <laughs> a little bit. I thought we were supposed to put them all on the web. Right, yeah. Just whatever you do, put them all on. Don't open your fire firewall or open your firewall to everything. It's fine. Um, and then enable port 80 on everything. Yeah. Into a patch. Yeah, and then into a patch. Yeah, reverse patch actually. Just go to like 1.0. It's the most secure. Um, so even WebEx, right? Um, Cisco WebEx is really, really often used. Um, you know, my organization uses it. There's, there's tons of vulnerabilities that pop up because it's a really complicated you know, application. Um, so all sorts of stuff. I mean, this was one just from October, like when I was researching where an attacker could execute commands with user privileges, right? Um, bad stuff. And these are just like a log of all the um, vulnerabilities that came out you know, in the past little bit. All right. <clears throat> so most vulnerable organizations. Um, the problem is there's not that I saw, I mean, I have to maybe look into it a little further, maybe get some data science expertise. But the vulnerability is that people aren't, in, you know, thinking about it when they install these. Somebody had, I think, somebody had mentioned that, you know, okay, well, when you put these devices in, think about what they're doing. You know, well, what, are, what is enabled by default? Um, most people don't do that, you know. Maybe it's because they got the, you know, the, the tasks handed to them of, okay, you need to come in here and install, um, you know, the stuff. We need, we need this equipment. Here's the budget. Um, the, the problem is, you know, most of the stuff isn't done in-house, um, and so it's exported to some sort of... I would say a lot of times some facilities group did it. Do right, right. So, like, my company does installs and planning and all that stuff, you know, and I just happen to work, like, the, the service aspect of it. Um, most people will hire somebody like my company, and they say, hey, here, give us a video system and make sure it works. And we're like, cool. And so, like, maybe they'll go ahead and do their due diligence and make sure it's patched, you know, as the firm, current version. But again, this stuff's expensive. Uh, and more than just that, just like security, AV is like bottom of the totem pole. It's not, you know, it, does, it doesn't necessarily matter that much. You know, people definitely let you know it matters when their phone doesn't work or their projector doesn't work, but, you know, doesn't get a lot of the funding and doesn't get a lot of the, excuse me, resources that it deserves. But if it works, don't touch it. Right, right. And, and it's, again, it's this idea that, like, well, it's in the wall. Like, what, what could go wrong? You know what I mean? Um, and more and more of these devices are having network ports and, ports and um, you know, internet capability, right? So here's the most popular uh, devices, MC3, SX20. Um, I think, I have to update that, actually, but I think there's a CP3 that's in there, too. Um, 
But you can see there's a, you know, there's a wide swath of, of different devices from both Cisco, Xtron, um, and Crestron. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a problem. It's definitely something that I think people need to start looking at. The top organizations found 1,100 uh, something organizations in total. Um, this was interesting because on a lot of the slides, you know, in the research I was doing for specific devices, you'd see like, wow, that school has a ton of you know, open, open devices. You're like, oh my gosh, but the, the vast majority was just Comcast. So it's some private organization. So maybe that's, you know, a school, but most often maybe that's some business, right? Um, why is your firewall open? You know, it's not just schools. You can see, I don't even, yeah, there's not even school, schools in the top 10. Um, on the contrary, here's top two universities, right? Again, if you're on this list, please talk to your networking team, close your firewalls, or at the very least, like unplug your all unnecessary audiovisual equipment from the network. You don't need to have it on the switcher. Your AV team, believe me, I would love to. If you have your firewall open, don't have it on the network. Here's kind of a more extensive um, <clears throat> devices over time chart that I found. Um, so you can see TV was up there. Um, and the, you know, all the other kind of small devices at the bottom here rel relatively stayed, stayed pretty stable. Um, I would love to see kind of over time, as I mentioned before, how, how it kind of shapes over a year. You know, is there actually some trend that I can oh, notice? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a great, great question, yeah. I took them on Friday right around like 2 o'clock, you know. Um, so, I mean, I've only been doing this for like a couple months, right? So, I, I don't know if that's a huge data set necessarily as far as time. Um, I would be very interested to see how it shapes up over time. All right. So, how do we secure organizations, right? Number one, stop putting crap online. It doesn't need to be online. I know you want to and just, no, stop it. Your, your switcher, your device, most likely does not need to be online. And if it does need to be online, even if it doesn't, close your firewall. It will save you in other ways. This is all the stuff that I found in just AV devices. If I went back to some of these same IP address ranges and looked for like RDP, or like open just like PCs, like I, I have no idea how much more I would find, right? This is just kind of hole in the wall stuff. Um, uh, two, authentication, right? Make sure, we really need to get rid of default passwords. Um, as I think, I think California is enacting some legislation by 2020 that gets rid of default passwords. And I think that is great. Um, I think it'd be really, really great if all companies could switch to that. Um, I know default passwords are convenient, you know, because you can go and you can check the manual. But even if you had like a rotating default password list, right, um, where you didn't necessarily label it, but it, you know, you got with it, um, something, something else other than just having like admin or one, two, three, four. Uh, two, three, security is a standard, right? Somebody had mentioned involving security in the development process, right? Um, so yeah, go ahead and ask somebody else to do these services for you and plan and um, you know, prov provide what you need, but make sure you, you, you give them a list of, okay, this can't fly, right? We don't have web pages that are open. Um, you know, change all our passwords beforehand, maybe give us a password, right? Or, or some, something like that. Like in, integrate security into the development process, and then if you can, consistent, in continual firmware process or upgrades and uh, in checks, right? Always be checking for new upgrades. It's really, really difficult when you have a really, really wide uh, selection of devices, but it is possible because a lot of these devices that you know they do have the network connectivity. But in addition to that, okay, cool. Well, now you can monitor them through some sort of resource resource mm -hmm. monitoring software, right? Um, I think Cisco. Xtron, just about all these major devices have some sort of platform where you can connect all your devices and you go whoosh, uh, firmware upgrade, and it upgrades all of them, right? Just like overnight patches. You can do that for AV devices. Um, if you do that, again, they're going to be on your network, close off your firewall, you should be doing that anyway. Uh, three or four, <laughs> subnet your, your devices, right? Pretty common, you know, basic security hygiene. Data over here, communications over there. Subnet your stuff, it's going to be much more secure. Uh, five, and I think this is a big one for like physical pen testing. You know, I don't know if anybody's necessarily going to go after the AV equipment, but it should be done anyway, just because end users like to they break. They are it now, anything. right? Now, yeah, they are now. Yeah. You just opened the door. Yeah, I know, right? What have I done? Um, 
<laughs> it's a good it's a good practice anyway. Make sure to lock your rack, both the front and the back door, um, because people will go try to go in there and fix everything, and they're like, oh, it doesn't work. Hold on, I don't need to call this guy, and then he breaks all of it. Um, and even other than that, you can't get access to it when you know you should. Uh, number five or number six? Gosh, I can't count today. Um, Make sure to enable audit logs. A lot of devices don't have audit logs enabled by default, right? If you have audit logs enabled um, and a password so that you know the hacker or the bad guy can't disable the audit logs, um, you can see you can see what happened, right? So here's an example of uh, you know integrating integrating security in AV, right? Um, just do a threat vulnerability assessment. Um, so you got open ports, projectors, you know, like. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but run through, you know, a threat vulnerability assessment on your devices, right? Take the time to do the research. You're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on these devices. Wouldn't that really suck if you spent all this money on it and it turned out to be a giant security hole? In a general, um, I guess maybe kind of strict. Uh, Ideology is, you know, with the connection network, it's probably a risk, right? Especially with audiovisual devices, they're really, really vulnerable. So, you know, if you, on one hand, if you do put it on the network, you can have automatic firmware upgrades, and you can manage it from a, you know, cloud system or some sort of, you know, oversight management software, right? That's really nice. On the other hand, why are you putting your switcher on the network? <laughs> like, you don't need to. Two, phones and communication, right? Um, Make sure to monitor, uh, and again, firmware, firmware upgrades. Uh, minimize open ports. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, separate your network into you know, data and voice traffic, uh, and if you can, you know, end-to-end -end encryption. And then, again, patch, 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 right? <laughs> video conferencing. Um, enable encryption <laughs> on calls. Um, most video conferencing you know, systems, they're really expensive in high level pieces of equipment. They have encryption options, right? Most people just don't enable them. Um, two, disable broadcast streaming. Um, far end ca camera control, there's an auto answer feature where uh, for, for a lot of devices where if you call it, it'll just answer. Um, don't don't enable that, you know, like the end user can in fact use their finger to answer, right? Like they're able to do that. Um, and then specifically with video conferencing, these are going to be online. So monitor them with the tools that are given to you. Um, most of them are, you know, supplied by the actual manufacturer when you get it. Manufacturers, what can you do? No more default passwords. Please stop. Um, disabling, you know, unnecessary ports. Um, HTTP web interfaces, they need passwords. All basic security hygiene stuff that I've talked about in this. Um, if you can, automatic firmware updates, right? If it's gonna be on the network, then okay, why can't we have it do an automatic firmware update, right? It's most likely not gonna break your system, a lot of these devices, um, but it will patch security vulnerabilities. Um, triggered alerts upon, out upon outage and other sort of fun things that you can do with management software, right? And again, audit logs. All right. Hey. Does the California legislation also address having no passwords? Because I feel like that would be a pretty good solution. I believe so. I haven't looked into oh, it specifically. No default passwords? Right, no default password. All right, cool. They're just unauthenticated and like five steps back. Yeah. Um, no, the question was, you know, does the California legislation uh, address the idea of having no passwords? Um, I, I believe so. I have to look into that. Um, but I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, as you know, forcing people to have some sort of password. It's not that hard, you know what I mean? Gener create a randomly generated <coughs> password, put it in your manual, and, or more than just that, you know, upon first initialization, you know, have it create, force it to create, or have it force you to create a password, right? It's not that hard, it's been done, done, been done before. Two, um, if you do have it on, to, on a network, then use a management software, right, to upgrade firmwares on a regular schedule. You can get notifications whenever a new, new firmware comes out for your devices, right? It's not that hard to set up some sort of email reminder. Um, and then you can have it update all the devices across your entire network. You don't have to have me go out there and update it. Um, and also your devices are probably going to work better because they probably found other bugs and crap that was causing issues in those devices too. Three, robust passwords, as you mentioned, right? Having a good password. We all know the importance of having strong security passwords. Four, uh, include AB, AB devices in your IPS and IDS system if you can. Um, I'm not super familiar with all that, but just sounds like a generally good thing that you should do um, if you can. 
Uh, five, vet AV products for security issues and vulnerabilities, right? Uh, before you go in and install them, make sure it doesn't have anything that you're going to get surprised about. Six, encryption on communications, right? Make sure all your stuff's encrypted. You can't have people snoop in your uh, communications. And then seven, lock and restrict access to racks. Um, make sure that people can't come, on, come, come in there uh, knowing some of the stuff that you can actually do and, you know, plant something. A lot of these probably have USBs, right? You could write some sort of script and then boom, you have, you pwned your, you know, AV switcher and you can propagate through the rest of the network, right? Um, I, I expect, you know, what, with some of these vulnerabilities becoming more popular, pen testers will maybe find this stuff too. Lock up your X. Thank you. Um, so thanks to you guys, for one. Uh, I got a lot of uh, inspiration from Dan Tatler's talks, as well as the Ricky Headless, uh, Zeke Lachey. And uh, yeah, just thank you for all your ongoing support through this whole process. It's been a huge learning development, and uh, I really appreciate it. So I do have, I realize I put it at the end. I do have one more section. Oh, I'm sorry. We can, let's do Q&A first, and then we'll get to that if we, ha if we have time, okay? How much time do we have? You're flying. You got like 15 minutes to beat the longest talk ever. Oh shoot! I got to stall. Okay, <laughs> bring on the questions. Let's go. What's up? I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done any disclosures yet? I was pretty open about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was working on that, um, and I've been trying to find the line between that because out of a ton of these different devices, I'm like, one, how do I track down where everything is? Like the schools, I was looking into it. Um, I didn't specifically discover anything that was new. Um, sure. So all these CVEs are not mine. I don't, I don't want to take credit for any of those. Um, you can look them up and find the authors. But um, In particular to the people that you took a look at. Right, right. I was trying, I, I was originally working on that and I was discouraged by one of my professors to not because um, there's a lot of legal trouble yeah, that can come. Yeah. And I'm not backed by a company. Like my, my, my boss is all about it, but if stuff hit the fan, I don't think it would go very well. Um, so It'll be better every day. What? So we be better at redacting. Right, right. <laughs> well, this is more of a comment. We might want to start making friends with someone like at the FBI, where you can pass this along. To yeah, them. right. I found RDP issues with the college. Right. And I passed it along, and that's how right. I stepped away, so I went. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, 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 that's the difficulty, you know, with the, the, what he was talking about is, you know, for everybody on the stream is, is, you know, the difficulty with disclosing vulnerabilities when you find them, um, because a lot of times people get screwed over, right? They find something and they're like, hey, this is like really bad, I'm trying to help you out. And they're like, what did you do? You broke her whole thing. You're like, oh, no, no, that's not, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult. I, I talked to Brian because I did find a couple devices that were from uh, MSU that were online and he forwarded to his team. Um, but that, that's definitely a great recommendation too. Any questions? So at this point, I don't even need to go into the open, unoccupied conference room with audiovisual equipment because according to what you just showed me, I can just do it. Right, right. That's it. Okay. So when you get better security than I'm going to the conference room? No, I know. From there, okay. Yeah. It's like we need to have, you know, we need to have security integrated with an AV. Um, I think it's been a long battle between between AV and IT for a while. Um, you know, the, the tradition is that you know AV's been over here, and you had like concerts and lighting and all this stuff that was sort of audiovisual productions, and then you had the IT. And, and as 2018 and you know time goes on, they're becoming closer and closer. And I think AV has a lot of catching up to do in terms of security with regards, right? Um, AMX did really well because. Like I said, I couldn't find a ton of devices. Maybe that's because I, you know, just happened to be that there's not a big data set out there. I, I don't know, uh, but I do know that AMX did up its security and was like, we're gonna double down, really hit some of these issues, potentially that I talked about, right? Um, it'd be great to see if you know Crestron and uh, you know Xtron and some of these other devices and you know could, could follow that path. And, and mind you, these, these are kind of just the big main manufacturers that I found. There's tons and tons of devices. I mean, and in manufacturers that are out there, right? Pointing something out, there were too many Cisco devices with default passwords and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I can't, I can't speak to specifically like how many passwords there were. That was one of the things I was really curious about. But without like going in and like knocking on every door, so to speak, it's like how do you find that? Um, and as I understand, that's a big no-no. So I'm not really trying to do that. Um, but Cisco being a security company, you from what you presented, there was a lot less Cisco than there was. Oh, right. Was right. Right. And, and that's definitely the thing. I, I think you know Cisco definitely has a much stronger security posture. But, um, but I was just saying, it's probably also the difference between 
who has an AV group versus an IT group, right? Mm -hmm. The IT group already has a contract with Cisco for the switches and routers and all that stuff. So they say, hey, you got conferencing stuff too? Sure. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. As opposed to, I just need a multimedia system. Right. I call right. digital group down the street. Right, so, right. Well, and even not just, I mean, it's not even just like the small groups that do that. Um, you know, there's a huge industry for installing and planning. I mean, my my company, um, you know, where I where I work is one of the big three auto manufacturers, right? Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily even the small guys who are like, we need help with it. The big guys need to help too because they have, you know, hundreds of conference rooms, right? right? So, that's a really good point. Do you think it would help or hurt making these uh, with more of the security able by default to be disabled? Like putting it into a lockdown state as a default when it ship is when you get firmware, this is how it comes. And if you want to open it up, you do it. Because part of me is thinking that half the reason a lot of these systems stay as open as they are is they ship that way and nobody knows it's closing down. Right, yeah. No, that, that's what I would definitely do. I mean, lock it down by default, you know what I mean? Um, give only the bare minimum. Um, you know, enable the control port. So, for example, Crestron having it at seven, you know, seven. You, you can't avoid that, but what you can avoid is having your network open right with that. But yeah, I absolutely agree. Lock down everything that you can um, be, as, as a standard, and then if they want to open it up, then that's on them. You know what I mean? I was going to say, well, another part to be mindful of is the reason why it's like that. Like There's a what? How much business you would lose right. if you locked it down. And you're just like, hey, figure it out. Every one of your competitors is shipping it wide open. Yeah. Right. There's no trouble and all of a sudden right. you get five times as many support tickets. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with your product? Yeah, you're, right. bank, you're well, bankrupt right. in 2008. But, right. but if you took the recommendation of you know, either use VLANs or subnetting, you know, so you keep it separate and it's behind the firewall, like absolutely what need do you have for the right internet folks to come in this way, right, to manage it? To me, it's probably just those, those companies that are external that just leave that back door open. Right to, you know, just adjust from their office versus making a service call. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's more than just that, I'll get you here just one second. Um, it's more than, more than just that, too. You know, you have the, the basic, you know, like flagrant, you know, okay, this stuff's just open, right? But then you also have stuff, as we noticed, that people didn't know about, you know? The, it's not like the, you know, I don't think the manufacturer intended to ship out a vulnerability that the guy could go in and stream the camera <laughs> to the touch panel, right? Um, stuff just happens, as we know. Um, but, but yeah, more of a reason to have it locked down and have it managed, you know. My, my thought is, you know, okay, if it has to be online, then okay, put it online. But like manage it under some sort of system or I'm sorry, under some sort of service um, and definitely obviously have it behind your firewall. Oh, I just sort of adding to what other people have said that, I mean, I work in a company who produce products and there's enormous um, tension between um, business development, product managers, developers, security, um, and yeah, they just, they just, they want to make money. Right. And, even top level executives are willing to take uh, a lot of risk. Right. And they take a lot of risk in lots of other ways because some of them are to make securities fraud or right. you know, whatever. Right. And so it's it's very difficult to, from, from, in terms of being an engineering problem, this is pretty simple and a lot of the suggestions right. we ever saw it for sure, but it's. From like a business yeah, standpoint. Engineering yeah, engineering is just sort of one rubric on the queue. Right. Well, you got all the, somebody had mentioned earlier, yeah, I think it's really, really tough. Yeah, like yeah. having the different silos fight against each other. You know, you have security over here being like, this is a problem, and then you have sales being like, okay, but like if we do that, like somebody mentioned, now all of a sudden we're not gonna sell everything, because everybody's gonna be like, what do we do? So I'll, just you give you, I'll give you just one really sort of basic example. So we, we have a SaaS product, and there's a sign-up process, like all SaaS products have, and we used to uh, have people um, enter their password twice. You know, when they signed up, they put their email address, and then we asked for password. And product got upset with this and, and made us change it to only entering the password once because having entered the password twice made it too hard, made it harder right. to sign up. <laughs> Which you're like, that's. <laughs> you should have made it entering your token. Right. And then yeah. your but I'm just saying, like, it gets that stupid. So it's you took out the password and, and enabled a retinal scan. Like. Yeah, just. <laughs> well, right. I would say it's like, it's like, it's like you have websites and analytics, right? You're going to see what so right. for that, they bounce right. 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 So it's like, you're going to have to do I got a little bit more if you got some extra time, if that's. Extra time. Extra time. <laughs> you just steal that. You're wrong. You're, you're you just steal that throne. Are you trying to break my record? I won't. I won't steal your shit post throne, but I'll steal your your talk. Yeah, seven minutes. Let's go. Seven All right. minutes to beat it. Um. I have a bedtime, you know.
<laughs> so here's some extra links. Um, it won't take that long. Um, this is the Crestron PYMG Smart Home. Um, <coughs> IoT nightmare, welcome to it. Um, this can control, like a lot of these other devices, uh, lights, doors, thermostats, TVs, media sources, touch panels, stereos, whatever you want to, right? Um, it's you know a lot like a lot of these like Samsung hubs, right? If you want to control My something, gas huh? My gas cooktop. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you even see that? Oh, I I think he was I. I <laughs> I realized he was he was making a goof, but yeah, you could probably control my gas cooktop. Yeah. It, it's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled. Right, right. Bluetooth enabled cooktop. Like this, yes. <laughs> so thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, there's a ton of them online. Um, why are these not behind your firewalls? These are literally your homes. This is no longer. I mean, I guess maybe that is why, but. So you got, you know, the like overzealous like tech dad who's just like, and I am the tech dad, so I emphasize with this gentleman, but he's like, I'm going a, I'm to a revolutionize my house, and he's like, I'm going to get one of these guys, and then... The power goes out and gets weird. Right. <laughs> Honey, why are, the, why are the lights strobing? Um, so yeah, you know, this is a touch panel that was online, um, or the, this was the touch panel interface that was online, um, so you can go obviously to the lights. Um, I think there's some that are more advanced, you know, again, you can put whatever you want on this, but this is like the general setup. Most of them are lights, you know, and uh, you, know, you, you can have like cameras and all this stuff. Like, okay, well, what, what is this stuff? All right. Um, you can control all this stuff. I was like, okay, there's a barn, and there's a barn aisle, and a building for it. What is happening? This is not a house. Um, it turns out that this was like a veterinary, like, stable clinic thing. Like maybe in like Kentucky for horses or something. I don't know. Um, but clearly it had a barn. Um, that lights, you know, I, I could turn on and off. Right. Honest question, did you mess with the lights? No, I didn't. Okay. No, uh, and you that Somebody out there's like, <laughs> he sure did! <laughs> yeah. uh, did you look into uh, Google system Go uh, Google Echoes? Or, uh, yeah, those, uh, or Amazon? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't look into those. That would be another talk that would be great. I think Ali was talking about digging into a little bit of that. Um, awesome. So, yeah, that potential future license. talk coming up, yeah. Um, the next part was really great too because so okay I got access to your touch panel and yeah maybe it seems to just be the lights um, but you know you can go and turn off all the lights um, you can go in and click the little wrench there right and it gives you this which is a separate web page that opened up in a new tab and then logged me in with all of the metrics and oh, everything right. for your light usage. You can literally map out this guy's entire Right, day. right. <laughs> you can go in, I mean, well, notice there's a section for climate too, so <laughs> these, have, these have climate controls on them as well, right? Um, how much time do we have? I want to be quoted. You know. Yeah, I think that's the thing. If I was, you know, if I was local, one, one you can do, you know, an IP geo lo lookup and find out where the location is, right? Um, and then two, you know, you can find, like I said, where this is. I was just amazed that, like, I could click this and it logged me in. Like, I'm not obviously not like who this belongs to, and I just clicked the link that was provided by that little toolbar, and all of a sudden I can go in and see your entire life. You know, I can. So could you turn off the security alarm? If they had it on the touch panel, yeah. Okay. Right. And unlock the door. Right. I could unlock it. I mean, like you know, you, all of the things that IoT touches, right? Like you, you have all these, you know, doorbells. I'm sure all of this stuff like integrates with these touch panels. And so, if you wanted to go in and, and break it or turn it off, I mean, you know, okay, send in the troops. Like you could. Go ahead. Be honest. You you set all the animals free. I, all of them, all of them. <laughs> I came in over the overcome, I said, let my people go! And like, they just changed the wall, the background. What's up? And it went into the inventory of so all the drugs. Another thing to think about, not so much in the US, but yeah. I know in Britain and in Canada, insurance companies now, if you, if you don't tighten your stuff up, they're not going to pay your claim when you get ripped off. Oh, really? So you're okay. Verbal, because you took a couple of pictures that you're in Mexico on Facebook, Wow, really? You can see when you're home and when you're not home. Wow, okay. So a lot more of the onus is on you because now you're publishing this information right. whether you know it or not. So right, well, and then that, that's just the thing. I mean, if you take into the mind, you know, okay, this is Crestron, so they have some sort of mindset. And maybe it's not the same vulnerabilities, but I'm sure there is with these. Um, 
you know, stuff that stuff that's just unauthenticated by default. Um, you know, uh, I, I didn't even go into like the different ports that might have been open for these. Um, and you know, looking into like FTP servers, like who knows? You maybe somebody has like a media server there, um, which maybe it's just like music. So like, thanks for the album, dude. But um, you can also, yeah, more importantly, see like the the actual you know time that they're there, like the climate. I mean, you have the same sort of visibility as like their energy company. Like, so is there? Does this actually have the API calls? Um, I don't know. I would have to look into it. Uh, this was just one of the extra things that, I, as I was going through the different models, as I was going through the different models, I was trying to find out what everything was because I actually hadn't heard of everything on the list. Um, and I said, "Oh, PYNG Hub. That's that's really interesting. I wonder what that is." And I, you know, found out that it's a smart home. Um, so I'm sure there's all sorts of documentation on, on it, um, just like all these other devices. Um, I just didn't get a chance. To I see it. climate up there. Please tell me that's not that's climate. So they, they don't. They, it's grayed out. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're surely touch panels, you know, if people spend all this money, um, you, you got to remember, Crosstron is not a consumer level product manufacturer. They're making consumer level products and jumping into that space with this device, but for the most part, they cater to the big boys, with the big conference rooms and all this stuff, right? Um, so they're not going to have... Um, the same security, you know, ideas. But yeah, that's that, that's definitely. Were you able to actually see metrics for climate? I, I wasn't able to because they didn't have it enabled. But if they had it enabled, I would be able to. Yeah. So if they had like their Nest or whatever set up to it, um, then you you could go in and, and see all that metrics. <laughs> Did I do it? Mission accomplished.